What's up guys, I want to talk about in today's video how position 4s have impact, especially in the pro scene. These movements are very important. Basically, I want to make sure you understand what you should be doing in the early game as roamers in particular. These heroes, the roamers I will be mentioning, are the likes of Earthshaker, Tinies, Tusks, Earth Spirits. So if you like playing heroes like that, Clockwork, then this is the video for you, right? I'm really going to be breaking down the movements so you can understand what players like Yapsor and GH do to actually crush the early game. And let's get into it. Patch 7.23 has been one of the best patches of all time. I'm not kidding. I actually think this patch is absolutely fantastic. So much so that I've been playing it a lot and learning about the patch. It's really been a blast. And as a result, we've made over 36 new pieces of content in the last week. Me, your boy, Speed. Frempo, a top offering player, and Yamsen, a top carry player, have been dissecting the patch at length over on the main Game Leap website. We've had hundreds of people sign up in the last week, and they've been all raving about it. So if you're interested in understanding the patch better than everyone else, click the link down below in the description, and I'll see you there. So the first thing that Gapsor does in this game, which I'll be briefly talking about, is starting in a tri-lane. This is a big deal, because it actually allows him to get a ton of damage onto Miracle in the early game. So as a support duo, if you're playing with like, let's say another friend or friends, then this is a good play to make where you actually just go bottom together and try to start off the lane by pressuring a weak safe laner, right? It's just a really good thing to do. Instead of him running out of Venno, right? He could run at Venno, but like, do you want to run out of Venno? Not really. So he runs at Morphling. And sure, he's not in position to actually do anything, but now they can even just run at GH a little bit. And using this boots that he has and started with, he's able to get quite a bit of damage, which is why buying boots is very, very good if you plan on roaming. Now, the next thing he does is he has to identify what lane he can actually have impact in, right? Does he want a lane with a Doom? No, Doom doesn't provide kill potential. The hero naturally does not do a lot of damage early on, right? At least within the first two levels. Not a lot of damage, so he doesn't want a lane there. The only thing he would do is sap a lot of XP from the Doom, and that would wouldn't help anyone. So, what he does instead, after checking bottom and realizing that there's not much he can do, he sees a very low Ember Spirit in the mid lane, and even if the Ember Spirit wasn't low on HP, he would still probably try to go mid, right? Only because it allows him to start walking towards top without having to TP, and I personally believe top is where he has to go in this game, and I think he knows that as well, because his top lane is very difficult. It's a Warlock Venno top, which is abysmal lane, like, to lane against. It's just obnoxious. <laughs> and he has a AM and a Dazzle, and Tiny is actually very good with Dazzle and lane, because you can toss people in the heal bombs, and it's very effective, so we're gonna be seeing that later on. So he goes mid, right, with his boots, and now how does he actually try to gank this Ember? The gank actually doesn't work out, but it's very important to understand how these pros try to read movements. So the first thing he does is he's paying attention to this range creep. I think he knows that the Ember Spirit wants to go for this, and so you'll see him click out when the creeps are getting pretty low, right? right now you see him click out he's like the ember has to go for this right now we doesn't because he's probably reading this gank but a lot of pub players you caught them right there you caught them if you pay attention to creeps and go based on you know what the creep hps are that's how you catch people when roaming it's it's nothing else players think it's random and they just use their eyes it's just like oh i see the hero no you use it you read them based on the creeps. That's how you get into people's heads. Now the gank ends up failing. No big deal, right? Not optimal, of course. But now, as I said, this allows him to walk top and immediately get a rap play onto the top lane, which, you know, maybe Nigma should have seen coming. But what are they going to do if they're, if Nigma reads this gank or backs off? What is even the play for them? Do they just, like, stop laning? You can't stop laning. It's not like you can just completely leave the lane. So, I mean, they, they stay up here, right? Also, Matumba Men's giga low, so it's like, all right, I mean... This kind of stinks. So uh, Enigma does, definitely does not feel pressured, right? Because Miracle is just hella low. And Yapsor is trying to stay out of vision so that they don't know where he is. He sees Kuroki walking up here and then finally tosses him under the tower. And this is kind of tiny specific, but he's communicating with Matama Man to toss him under the tower, blocks off the tree path, sets up for this massive heal bomb, and they pick up the first blood, right? And that was just a really good play because now Kuroki doesn't have TP. So I kind of wish Kuroki didn't try to TP there. Um, I'm sure he probably regretted it as well. I didn't think he would die personally either, but like at, at the same time, it's like, uh, I don't know. It's kind of rough. Regardless, now what does he do next? He still has to identify what lane he can kill. Now he's like, okay, maybe I'll go mid, right? Because Ember Spirit's actually pretty gankable at this stage of the game. The hero doesn't have necessarily that high of armor. Does have a, uh, a buckler actually, so it makes it a bit harder. But overall, like Ember is a potential gank, but the much more reliable gank is on these immobile top heroes, right? And that's exactly what he's going to do here. He sees Mind Control stepping up. He knows that Kuroki has no TP, and as a result, he can apply pressure onto Mind Control. So it's all about like when you're playing these roamers, considering what lane you actually can have impacted, and then approaching at the right time based on either creeps or the positioning that they're currently taking right and as a result 
he's able to, you know, pick up two kills for his team. And frankly, this lane should not be going well, right? It's an AM against two of the most obnoxious laners in Dota, which is Warlock and Venno. So like the fact that they're doing well is just incredible. I mean, they don't end up even coming out of this laning stage ahead, but they certainly come out in a decent state compared to what it could be. And finally, we see the same thing here once again. It's really just a situation of you do not have to leave a lane once you gank it. He realizes this is his lane, so you just keep playing in it. And how does he go for the kill? He approaches, he avalanches, he tosses back to his AM, and that's that's about all. They go for the heal bomb, they get it off, goes for some body blocks because he has no spells up, and he picks up another kill. And now you might be like, well, what does he do next? What's his next play? Right? What what is Yapsor gonna do next? Is he gonna go mid? Eh, it's unlikely. You know, like, eh, you know, are they really gonna kill an ember? Probably not. You know, the Magnus is not even level 6. It's not even close, right? So it's not like he's about to RP into some, like, avalanche toss. That's not going to happen. So, uh, you know, what does he do? Well, first thing he does is he secures the rune, right? Which is great. It allows him to prevent the Ember Spear from getting a potential imported rune, which is a big deal. And now, once again, he can just walk back top. Shocking, he takes the long route once again to avoid getting scouted by wards and uh, just to, to get behind them. And as a result, they pick up another kill. And you notice it's just, you might be like, well, how does Mind Control fall for this? It's not a situation of falling for it. Like, Mind Control has to lane. Sure, maybe they could play more defensive. I'm not going to deny that. I don't think the way Nigma played this lane was good at all. Like, frankly, if you look back at it, they got separated a lot. And Kuroki dying without the TP prevented them from making coordinated plays onto the AM. Which allowed Secret to actually make plays. Because Secret was never that low on HP. Uh, they did ship out a lot of salves, so we'll play it on Matumba in there to allow them to apply aggression. But for the most part, it's really hard to avoid, you know, tri lane ganks when you have a hero like Tiny. It's why Tiny is so good in these situations. And then finally, the next thing he does is buy bottle. And he gets it around the 5 minute mark because he didn't buy any small items, which is good on heroes that want to buy bottle. And it allows him to contest the bounty runes and, you know, make a big play here, which is just a toss back and get the runes. So, really beautiful play from Yavsor in the early game here. I think this is what you really call effective impact where his movements are very crisp and clean and are protecting the most important hero in this game now the am only has 13 last hits however if we look at overall net worth he's not doing that bad right i mean this is a free farm morphling right so like unfortunately the, the offlane is sacked which is why you know they are not actually ahead in net worth but sometimes that's just the reality imagine imagine if you have sort of lane with the doom this game doom would maybe be like 200 net worth higher maybe like I, that's not even a guarantee because he would be a lower level overall but the am would be like pfft, like down here guaranteed the am would be down here because that there's no way they would ever kill venno or the warlock and am would get completely bullied out and it would be gg I, I guarantee this game would be over if he does not lane top this game i'm serious i actually think secret loses if yapsor does not go top this game All right for the next clip we're going to be following crit this is eg against flying pandas in the north american dream league season 13 qualifiers if i'm not mistaken this was for a spot at the minor and eg was up 1-0 and i think what he does this game is really really basic really simple now the plays he make in his mechanics and his understanding is like very great it's it's amazing but i really want to explain why sometimes this can be simpler than you think if you understand the matchup so in this game once again Tusk doesn't do particularly well against Weaver. It's not that Tusk can't do anything against Weaver. If you catch him out of Sakuchi, you absolutely shred him, right? But, but the, the issue with that is that then their bottom lane might be pretty hard, right? It's potentially an ABBA Disruptor, which is a strong lane, or an Abilina, which is also a strong lane. And they have a Tusk. Tusk is one of the best tri lane heroes in the game because you can buy an Orb of Venom and you can level tag team, and it basically makes you kill anyone if you happen to catch them out of position, which we'll be seeing a little bit later on. But now, the lane starts out, and Flying Pandas makes a really good adjustment to read the tri-lane. They completely read the tri-lane. They're like, yep, they are definitely, definitely tri-laning. And as a result, the enemy team does a really nice creep drag, right? So the Abaddon doesn't even show up to lane, right? And uh, that's just straight up massive for the enemy team. And what does he do to actually counteract this? You might be like, well, what is the special play he's going to make? Is he going to, you know, get a kill here, get a kill there? Actually, you'd be surprised. Nothing really that insane happens for the first, like, minute. I mean, he's literally done and hit no one. But you have to understand, it's better to just be in position and technically doing nothing than to be running around in the wrong lane and quote-unquote doing something. Like, let's say you hit the Weaver twice. I still wouldn't think it's a great play, right? Because it's like, does that really help the, the Omni? You're just sapping more of his XP. Instead, he stays in lane, 
and we'll be looking for an opportunity a little bit later on. Like, this looks awful, right? He's not killing anyone. He's not going on anyone. He just had to eat a tango for no trade. And and yet he's being patient, waiting for his opportunity because he knows this is his kill lane. And finally, he's communicating to his Bloodseeker. He's like, Cartesi, come up here. So make sure you talk in your pubs. At least ping to go on them. I always spam ping in my pubs. And now he goes on Snake King, pops the tag team. And with the tag team plus over Venom, uh, they manage to start harassing him down. As well as sniping a courier. A little bit of uh, miss courier usage there. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, definitely also snipe couriers. Tusk is a courier sniping machine because you have 313 movement speed. As well as an over venom. So it's just really easy. But then once again, same thing here. Just pressuring the same lane. Nothing too crazy. Tag team, orb of venom, and they pick up a kill. Right? It's all about patience and understanding what lane you're actually supposed to be killing. Because if he goes mid here, he does nothing at level 1. If he goes top here, he also does nothing. Omni Knight does not really want to lane with Tusk. It's not like you have a stun. You know, it's the same thing as Doom, essentially. It's like, eh, I don't really want your help. Unless you're some ranged hero who's going to zone for me and apply a lot of pressure. That's not Tusk. Tusk really prefers try lanes. Unless it's in a specific dual lane scenario like Enchantress or Nature's Prophet. Regardless, now they're just sort of diving them under tower. This ended up being a pretty bad decision overall all they didn't get much out of it sure they apply some pressure and make the abaddon most likely miss some last hits but overall nothing too crazy so what does he do next you might ask well now he has his shards and he can consider going mid consider right however it's a morphling so if morphling does not commit waveform tusk essentially provides nothing at least early on it's not too impactful right so he has to wait till he at least has snowball to track down the morphling right and he understands that he's like i need snowball if i'm going to be ganking mid for the most part right that is most likely going to be the highest impact play i can make so as you can see he's still just considering his options it's not like pros load into a game of dota and they're like i know exactly how the game's gonna go they read every single movement you make no that's not how it is they on the spot are making educated guesses based on heroes you know xp based on their levels based on their hp based on their skills all these things they make educated guesses and they're like okay morphling's probably not much of a kill so he just denies some creeps he legitimately just denies some creeps that was his impact there but it's fine. It's fine because now he's in position to go on Snake King, right? Tag team, blood right, kill. Simple. But it's only because he had patience and identified that the Abaddon was his kill. And I know I feel like I'm saying the same thing or similar things, but you have to understand that like sometimes Dota is simpler than you think and the play you're supposed to be making is more basic than you believe. And that's why players just are playing all over the place. And I, I coached some position four players in the past and it's like, they're just running around. They're just running around. Relax. Find your kill lane. And sometimes you need to stay there and wait for your opportunities. Now, he's been doing a good job staying out of vision, sort of moving around, you know, making his positioning uh, a bit unclear to the enemy team. There's obviously a lot of micro things there as well that you can identify uh, by yourself or maybe I'll do in a future video. But like for the most part, his macro movements are very simple. Right here, he's like, okay, my racer's diving mid, so I'll go to mid to, you know, help out with people TPing in. And that's exactly what he does. He's like, oh, maybe there's a disruptor kill here. No disruptor kill, that's fine. There is a disruptor kill doesn't get it that's fine it's like it's constantly just reevaluating what you can do it might seem like he's had very little impact this game but frankly it's much better than going 0 and 5 top lane to some weaver lena lane <laughs> And what do you know, guys? Kills bottom lane once again. But really, I'm going to end up the video around here only because I, I felt like this point just helps so many people when I finally explain it to them. So I thought it'd be good for you guys as well, where you have to understand what your hero is good at. If you are Alina, you don't necessarily want to play like this. You can, but not necessarily. You typically want to run more of a dual lane setup. But when you're a hero like Tiny or Tusk, who doesn't actually provide that much to specifically melee heroes in lane, even if you're a Ricky or a Bounty Hunter for, which I see a lot of people picking in their pubs, do not necessarily walk to the off lane. It doesn't help your off laner if you're a melee hero and you can't, you know, apply any pressure with them. It doesn't do anything for either of you, right? And as a result, your kills are bottom, right? And it's not like you always have to play around kills. It's also XP, right? If we look at the Bloodseeker, he's 5, to the Abaddon is now 3, only because of the pressure that has been applied to the Abaddon. And yeah, I just think this is beautiful Dota, clean Dota, very little mistakes. You know, now he's playing around his Razor, which is also fantastic. That could be for another video topic. Um, but really just the main premise of this is playing around your strongest hero. He knows that his Razor is a high tempo hero that he can apply a lot of pressure with him. And as a result, he goes and plays with him. It's really that simple, but sometimes, guys, the simplest ideas are what you guys need to implement the most, because that's what Dota is, in my opinion. It's a very complicated game with simple solutions, which sounds kind of weird, but it's like, if you overthink the game, you just straight up grief yourself, which is what a lot of position fours do. He literally has ganked bottom like eight times in a row this game, and that is it. 
He basically has done nothing mid. The only time he's been playing with this Razor is about now because the Razor is like absolutely dumpster in mid, eight to six. So he's like, okay, there's a huge level advantage I can abuse here. But look, once again, he <laughs> saves fly from a disruptor. Q back to bottom. Smokes up, legitimately making another play on this Abaddon, I think. I'm not kidding. I think he actually makes another play on Abba. No, no, okay. He goes mid to go play with this Racer, which is fine. Nothing even comes out of it, which is pretty funny, but... <laughs> Gets to mid tower. He's like, I don't even know what to do, guys. Crit's probably exclaiming, like, he's like, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> um, that's it sometimes. NA shards. We're going to end the video on that. If you guys think you can't go pro, you're kidding yourself. I'm kidding. Actually, going pro is one of the hardest things in the world basically impossible but uh bros make mistakes as well however their mistakes are significantly less consequential due to the fact that all their decisions previous to that were much much better but thank you guys for watching if you enjoyed please do like and subscribe to help our channel grow and hopefully i'll see you in the next one peace hey thanks everyone for watching the video but before you leave i just want to mention once again we've made 36 new pieces of content in the last week it's insane like we're literally pumping out more and more every single day just extremely consistent amazing content that we are making just for you guys so that you can excel in 7.23 so check it out and i'll see you there